Okay, so hi, hello everyone, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this event on how humans and machines see the world. I'm Joanna Zielinska, I'm uh, Interim Director of the Center for Attention Studies and a Professor in the Department of Digital Humanities here at King's. And I'm delighted to welcome our uh, distinguished guests, uh, uh, speakers as well as visitors. Um, we are going to have a kind of four presentations and a short screening today, and we're going to explore, you know, how humans see the world, you know, what disciplines, what academic disciplines, fields can teach us uh, how seeing unfolds, and whether there are any contradictions and tensions between different disciplines. And we'll also talk a bit about machine vision, computer vision, saying whether computers actually see, and is it a metaphor? Uh, can we assume that uh, what humans and machines have in common is seeing? Can we teach machines to see the way humans see do we actually understand how humans see the world at all if we have the ambition to uh, pass on these skills to machines so that's the kind of our ambit okay so uh, our first speaker is Leonardo Impet who is a university assistant professor in digital humanities at the University of Cambridge and a convener of the MPhil in digital humanities he's got background in information studies engineering machine learning but also art history so a Renaissance man, although a stamp as film has told us to be suspicious of all the different labels does designate uh, cultural trends. Um, he's worked with Cambridge Machine Learning Lab, Cambridge Computer Labs, Rainbow Group, and Microsoft Research in Cairo. His PhD was on the use of computer vision for the distant reading of the history of art. And he's also worked with a lot of art organizations, including Royal Opera House, with the Museum of American Art, and Liverpool Biennial. Leo, over to you. I'm going to talk about something, in fact, that has a, a bit of a relationship to what I was working on at Microsoft by now eight, nine years ago, something like that, um, which is really the moment when uh, we were faced with technical problems that were not just difficult, but seemed to me so absurd and problematic that it might be useful to engage with the uh, other people in the academy that thought about images, including art historians. So. Um, one of us can do easily, but few of us can explain how. To get a computer to do this would involve working out many complex rules about faces and writing a computer program. But this perceptron was simply given lots and lots of examples, including some with unusual hairstyles. But when it comes to a beetle, the computer looks at facial features and hair outline and takes longer to learn what it's told by Dr. Taylor. Andrew Cruikshank's wig also causes a little heart searching. After training on lots of examples, it's given new faces it has never seen and is able to successfully distinguish male from female. It has learned. While promising, this approach to machine intelligence virtually died out. I'm still trying to source exactly who made this video that's now sort of on YouTube and in all sorts of introduction to critical computer vision things. It's clearly about um, an implementation, implementation of the perceptron probably from the early 60s. But um, anyway, what I want to talk about really is the relationship, I suppose, between detection and generation in a certain kind of machine vision, which is not really about object detection and the sorts of bounding boxes that we saw um, in the wonderful uh, video earlier. And I want to start with a 1966 short story by Primo Levi, the, um, the chemist, partisan, Holocaust writer, etc. It revolves around a, a device called the calometer, as in Kalos, so not, not measuring heat, but beauty. Um, it's an electronic device made by a large American corporation that looks a little bit like a camera. When you point it at a person, it doesn't take their image, but rather it measures them. It gives you a percentage score of their physical beauty. Levy makes it quite clear that you don't need to understand anything about human aesthetics in order to be able to do this any more than he, you know, his example is an electrician needs to understand quantum physics in order to measure a voltage. And in the story, in fact, there are two such machines. One is intended to measure men, the other to measure women. Each machine comes preloaded with a kind of reference image, a training data set of one, if you like. So you can set your own, but the factory preloads an image of Elizabeth Taylor to measure women, and Raph Vallone, the Italian 
communist footballer and actor to measure men as the paragons of human beauty. Unconvinced the protagonist measures the beauty of the Mona Lisa, who gets 28%, uh, he tries to put abstract wallpaper of the sort maybe at the back of the room. Uh, that doesn't really produce anything meaningful. And finally, he retrains the machine with this portrait by Modigliani. This results in a kind of machine bias for women with long necks. If its aim is to reproduce human judgment, writes Levy, it is largely successful, but only in reproducing the judgment of an observer with an extremely limited and restricted taste, or rather of a maniac. So Levy's is the first description I know of of a computer vision system that is a camera connected to some sort of electronic brain for measuring human beauty. Early this century, however, this kind of machine has started to appear in the first of the research literature and subsequently a commercial sector, a rather large commercial sector for big tech. Um, I've put in your neighbours here at UCL. Uh, this clearly doesn't start from nowhere. We could go back to Firenzuola, to Winkelmann's description of ideal Greek bodies to Cesare Lombroso's criminological facial analysis and the host of other physiognomical studies in the service of scientific racism in the 19th and 20th century, I wanted to keep this brief and slightly lighter. So here is Max Factor, or Maximilian Faktorovitz's uh, beauty micrometer from the 1930s, intended for the movie industry. It never really caught on. Now, by 2001, Calvino's nightmare is realized at Stanford University, at least in prototype form. A computer vision system is created to automatically quantify what they call the facial beauty of images. Now, as soon as you can measure something with a computer, you can optimize it. This is the basic uh, building block of so many generative image systems. So just a few years later, by the mid-2000s, we have the emergence of so-called face beautification software. Now, by the late 2010s, smartphones contain excellent cameras and powerful enough processors to run sophisticated machine learning systems, so you get products like the one being advertised here on the right. Uh, the advert reads, ever wonder why, it's just here at the bottom, so many of you probably can't see it, ever wonder why your friend's selfies look so good? It questions. Download and subscribe. So this is an advert for the face beautification app Facetune, which uh, the previous year, 2017, was the most downloaded premium iPhone app. What lies behind these machines? How might we go about unpicking their internal visual logics? This seems to me an interesting example of what I might call machine visual culture, or to borrow a phrase that Jeff and I have worked on for many years, ways of machine seeing. And in fact, most of my work tries to show that visual ideology permeates through all levels of the computer vision stack, and not just the training data set. Uh, but in this short talk, I do want to focus specifically on training data and how data sets influence algorithms that influence other data sets that influence other algorithms. So a sort of uh, recursive palimpsestic uh, quality. So this is the Celeb A data set published by a team at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, it's become the most widely used facial biometrics data set of the past decade. It was published in 2015, subsequently used in over 7,000 uh, further studies. It consists of 200,000 images of 10,000 people, mostly taken from celebrity websites. I think you can see uh, Peter Sellers there. Each of which is annotated with 40 binary attributes, right? So tags, if you like. They're either true or false, present or not present. And here are some examples of those tags. So is the person wearing glasses? Do they have a pointy nose? Are they smiling? And so on. One of these tags is labeled simply attractive. Now, we can see a slight shift in semantics here from earlier papers referring to beauty. I wanted to see what sorts of associations the data set makes with faces that are labeled attractive. So I've calculated here the linear correlations between the category attractive and the other possible 39 possible categories. Now, it's a fundamental feature of probabilistic machine learning systems that correlations that appear in the training data set will be reproduced by the machine in making predictions. And here's what comes out. I'm sorry again if the bottom of the screen is slightly cut off. But in the features that are most positively correlated, which we have here at the bottom in green, we see uh, wearing lipstick is the most positively correlated, uh, heavy makeup, young, arched eyebrows, pointy nose, wavy hair, and in the most negatively correlated, male, big nose, chubby, eyeglasses, etc. Um, you notice that male is at the top of the table. There's no corresponding female down here. That's because there's no category for female. It's just male equals one or male equals zero, of course. And um, if we needed any other hints, uh, for how to read the 
gaze of this data set, this is their home page and logo. So it turns out that face enhancement apps and the beauty measurement algorithms that power them are now pretty much ubiquitous. Uh, the title of this talk is Touch Up My Appearance, and that's the name of the setting on Zoom, which is actually turned on by default. Um, occasionally, I've talked about this on Zoom, and it's much easier to show this live. So this is a, a GIF of me sitting in Heidelberg University Library a few months ago. But you can see that uh, bags under your eyes and things like that are appear and disappear relatively subtly, so that you know you often don't notice even on your on your own face. But um, these settings are turned on by default. So remember our Primo Levi tried to use his calometer on paintings on the Mona Lisa. Well, this too has been done in the field of digital art history, my other uh, hat, if you like. So in 2015, De La Rosa and Suarez applied facial recognition to a data set of 120,000 paintings in order, I quote, to establish whether there had been a single canon of beauty or whether this had changed over time. They do this not just by calculating the facial proportions and symmetries you can see here, but also by calculating the so-called average faces. And again, we go back to Francis Galton, people like that. And you can see that these average faces are made by century. That's the rose, if you like, and split up by gender. So there we go from the 13th century down to the 16th, 17th down to the 20th centuries. And we have female faces on the left, male faces on the right, and both in the middle. And again, this gender uh, classification before the average faces are created is also done, of course, algorithmically. What's interesting to me is that the same process was used much earlier by the American artist Jason Sullivan in many of his works from the so-called amalgamation series in the 2000s. Um, so we have Homes for Sale, 100 Special Moments. This one is called Portraits, where he averages images of portraits from Franz Hals, Velasquez, Van Dyck, and Rembrandt. And every Playboy centerfold, The Decades, from 2002. So we have the same sort of historical treatment of images of objectification, if you like, as in De La Rosa and Suarez. Um, this has average centerfolds of Playboy every decade from the 60s to the 90s. So there are four images in total. I'm showing two here. Salavon knows, of course, that the 1970s image, this one here, also includes the November 1972 issue with Lena Forsen, now known simply as Lena, which became the standard digital test image for computer scientists until very recently, and which was used as the basis for the JPEG format. Uh, of course, it's a kind of, uh, it's a SFF, SFW crop in tech speak of the original image. So again, this kind of visual culture, this gaze permeates all levels of the stack. I want to move from images of faces to images in general and briefly show you the problem I was working on at Microsoft, which is what I call prettiness estimation, but the technical literature uses many different names for it, as you can see on this slide. Broadly speaking, the systems work in much the same ways as those for facial beauty. So you have a set of human annotators, and they're asked to rate the images often on a sliding numerical scale from 1 to 10. But instead of images of faces, we have, if you like, images in general, any old photograph. So we're moving from a situation in which annotators are asked to objectify and quantify the thing being depicted specifically and explicitly into a situation where the relationship between depiction and depicted, between style and content, if you like, is much more ambiguous. How could a machine possibly reproduce these apparently deeply subjective judgments? Well, we might assume that everyone involved in creating these data sets has a very individual set of preferences, but that turns out not to be the case. So the authors of one of the data sets, the Aesthetics and Attributes database, find, I quote, that 98.45 uh, of batches have significant agreement among raters, and therefore the annotations are reliable for scientific research, end quote. So the kinds of judgments that they're working on are relatively consistent. Even once we have the data, you might think that it would be difficult to predict this kind of aesthetic score from an arbitrary image. Well, already by 2019, a model trained on the data set that we're about to look at could predict the average aesthetic score more accurately than a random sample from the human annotations. In other words, in some strange sense, computers are better than us at understanding what is averagely pretty. They're even more average than the average human annotator, and they're extremely accurate at predicting that average taste. OK, well, an average of which humans, of course, is the question. Clearly not all 8 million of us. Um, as one of the first prettiness estimation papers admitted in 2006, I quote, ideally, 
the data should have been collected from a random sample of human subjects under controlled setup, but resource constraints prevented us from doing so. So what do they use instead? Well, the most commonly used data set is a dump of the images and votes from the online digital photography challenge website, DP Challenge, which you can see on this screen. You can still see it at dpchallenge.com. Normally, computer vision data sets are sort of crowdsourced through distributed platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk, and that makes it difficult to understand just whose judgments are being captured. Uh, DP Challenge, instead, has a situation where the photographers are also the voters, and it allows members to give their location, their biographical summary, their age, and even a list of cameras that they own. So we actually have information about who is creating the images and who is annotating them, since in DP Challenge, they're the same group. And I always feel slightly guilty at this point, because um, I don't mean really to uh, criticize or insult the people of DP Challenge, who um, I'm sure are all very nice, and certainly <laughs> I can find no evidence that they ever asked to or even agreed to be in a computer vision training data set. They just happen to have a fairly liberal content usage policy. So this is the sort of information that we might see um, from a DP Challenge user, and therefore from a person who contributes to making the images and putting the annotations in the data set. So when I last looked into this, of the 10 users who've got the most votes on DP Challenge, so who've been scored the most, six were within the US, two were in Canada, two were in the UK. Uh, eight out of 10 give their age, all between 53 and 75. Half of them have got iPhones as well as their digital cameras. I decided to do this a bit more consistently and took a large random sample of users that are actually in the data set, because of course it's frozen in 2012. And you can see here their distribution geographically. Um, so it goes up to 49.6% come from the United States, and uh, they're otherwise very much distributed in rich Anglophone countries. And demographically, so here we have uh, again, this is for users that report this, but we have men in red and, uh, well, females in blue. And you can see here that we're largely talking about middle-aged men from the US, right? 35 to 70 or something. What sorts of images do they like? Well, challenge-winning photographs often feature extremes of saturation, either dramatically colored skies captured in high dynamic range or black and white perfectly monochrome images. A large number are landscapes, or what I sort of might call still lifes. They frequently include domestic and wild animals, but very, very rarely include any people. These, by the way, are examples of the sorts of average annotations that the website saves. So rather than just showing you more images of the data set, let's travel one level up the stack, as it were, and look at images that are ranked as pretty by a machine learning system that is trained on the DP Challenge data set. All of these, I think you'll agree, are sort of hypersaturated or monochrome. All are landscape, except two which we might call still lifes. There are no people at all, as far as I can set, uh, tell. So I think you get an idea of the sort of style, the vibe, the, the aesthetic of uh, DP Challenge here. We might hypothesize that in this visual logic, um, Komar and Melamid's wonderful 1995 work, the USA's most wanted painting, would do rather well. Its conditions of production are somewhat analogous. So the artists commissioned a market research firm to gather data uh, from people in the street about customer preferences on color, size, iconography, and so on, and designer painting based on survey outcomes. Let's do the opposite and look at images that the algorithm considers the ugliest. Um, here we have topically the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, uh, a birthday cake, there's a hippie who seems to be only wearing flowers, there's a Nintendo SNES, and so on. Okay, so why is it important to understand or at least highlight these prettiness estimation data sets? Well, it turns out that these algorithms are used pretty widely. Um, image search engines measure the aesthetic score. It's one of the images that, it's one of the factors that influences an image's ranking. And when your phone or social media website needs to show you a preview image for a photo uh, folder, it will take the one with the highest aesthetic score. So at Microsoft, we were working on OneDrive, OneDrive uh, preview image things for little folders with, you know, photos from the same wedding on or something like that. It's also very widely used in smartphone cameras. So all of the cropping, changing the saturation, the contrast, and so on, that they do to enhance the images is, in fact, to increase the measured aesthetic score. So that kind of automatic photo enhancement has become a major player in the smartphone arms race. 
Um, they often call them AI-powered cameras, and Apple's enhancement system, Deep Fusion, was marketed as a major feature of the iPhone 11 in 2019. It turns out, though, that um, with generative image systems, there's one last use case that I want to highlight, which uses um, the DP Challenge dataset specifically, and algorithms trained on it quite transparently. So uh, the largest and most commonly used open source image generation system, Stable Diffusion, is trained on this huge data set of images with tags called Lion, Lion 5B, which means 5 billion images with textual annotations. And in fact, it's close to 6 billion. And um, Lion Aesthetics is the data set you're looking at at the moment. It uses a pretty simple neural network predictor trained on the DP Challenge data set we've just looked at to filter through these 5 billion images of Lion and extract only those with what it considers to be a high aesthetic score, 6.5 out of 10. I think you can recognize something of the visual taste of DP Challenge, those are HDR slots and so on, you know, the, the taste regime, if you like, of those largely 35 to 7 year old men in the US in these highly ranked images. Now, because the Lion Aesthetics dataset is itself used as the final stage of training in Stable Diffusion, which is the most widely used open source AI image generation tool, um, the internet is now littered with images from Stable Diffusion that incorporate this particular taste regime, if you like. And, um, of course, going on, uh, it's likely that future image generation systems learn from generated images that are on the internet, and this you know, gets sort of embedded in the whole ecosystem. So I suppose I wanted to conclude... Um, ooh, that's my very gentle timer. I wanted to conclude by pointing to this sort of intertwining of aesthetic measurements of people and of images in general. Where do the two intersect? Uh, technically speaking, they seem to be two completely different problems with two completely different data sets worked on by completely different research teams. And yet, stable diffusion now is used, and this is my last slide, um, normally in making highly sexualized female characters. I thought I'd make a, show you an example of uh, at least one that's about men. Um, but in littering the internet with these sort of generated people um, that have not only a kind of physiognomic uh, augmentation, if you like, but also a general stylistic one. So there's a kind of convergence there between aesthetic uh, estimation and aesthetic enhancement according to a very particular taste regime <laughs> in, uh, in people and in images. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Amazing how everything looks like a sunset even if it's an AI-generated face. Thank you so much, Leo, for the brilliant introduction to the topic, the framing. So we are now moving on to Daniel chavez Eras, who is a lecturer in digital culture and creative computing here at King's, as well as a member of the Computational Humanities Group and a research fellow at the Creative AI Lab, which is a collaboration between King's and Serpentine Galleries. Daniel specializes in computational production and analysis of visual culture. He's worked extensively in interdisciplinary design in creative industries in Mexico and in the UK, with cultural institutions such as the British Council and the BBC. And his book, Cinema and Machine Vision, which the world is waiting for, is coming out from Edinburgh early in 2024. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you. Sorry, I just can't take my eyes. <laughs> It's going to be really difficult to, to compete with the handsome people on the screen. I, I have to say my presentation is a lot less pretty and beautiful in that sense. Um, if, if I can get it to ever work. Yep, here you go. So, um, oops. Right. Uh, no, where am I? I? I'm lost. Here you go. So that's my speaker view right here. Yep, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for the kind invitation. Um, so I'm going to jump uh, into it. Um, hope you can see. Yes. 
Right. So, so, so Jonas' question about whether machines can see or not, I mean, my, my short answer would be maybe that they cannot. <laughs> At the same time, we see through machines all the time. Machines allow, have allowed us to see the world in, which, in ways in which our senses alone cannot. In this way, human vision is embedded in machines and machine vision, and machine vision in turn reshapes what we can see and how, expanding our visual faculties in one direction by contracting them in another. I don't think this is any controversial to, to this audience uh, to say that uh, vision, human vision is also, and has been for a long time, technically mediated. Uh, philosophy, especially aesthetics, has been keenly aware of this for at least 100 years. Computer vision is part of this longer history of technical, the technical reshaping of the visual, from painting to photography to cinema. To understand how machines are set to see on our behalf, it makes sense to explore machine vision through the lens of technologies of vision, the kinds of images these technologies afford and the audiences these images create. At the same time, this emphasis on technical uh, uh, vision, the, te te the technicality of vision, helps us un understand how we can intervene and uh, redesign and redesign of machine vision and to enter into more meaningful, meaningful collaborations with disciplines uh, of in engineering and the sciences. So in a nutshell, this is uh, what my uh, forthcoming book that John was telling you about is, 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 ab is all about. It's called Non Cinema and Machine Vision. So in this book, uh, uh, I, for this talk, I will just uh, kind of talk uh, the facts and, uh, in, on, and of motion uh, that kind of structure cognitive and affective responses in their audiences, uh, moving images that move us, say. So as I said, I will focus on these two, uh, and I will talk a little bit about uh, discuss philosophies uh, of times and temporal dynamics in moving images from a computational perspective. Uh, so besides part of the theoretical part of the book, I have a couple of recent experiments, so you'll get kind of the cutting edge sort of thing, but mind you, maybe a little bit less polished um, uh, than, than, than what you'll find in the book. So let's just, let me start by asking a very basic question. Why is cinema not incredibly confusing and disorienting? So the passage that you see on the screen, there is a well-known passage uh, of uh, film art where Arnheim asks precisely this, why, why are we not confused? Why are not we completely disoriented by this radical fragmentation of space and time? Uh, how do we parse this shattered temporality into a comprehensible whole that uh, we can somehow relate to actual uninterrupted lived duration? Uh, films are, of course, made by a number of small fragmented recordings that, when organized in a certain way, they make sense as a whole and add up to a new kind of synthetic temporality, what we now uh, understand as cinematic time. Now, one part of the answer, and what you probably see on the screen right now, is that, uh, and kind of prefigured by the screening that we saw at the beginning, is that this ability to watch films has been learned over time. It was not always the case that we, need, that we have known how to interpret a close-up, for example. So on the screen, you see one of the earliest examples of a close-up. This is uh, George Albert Smith's um, uh, grandma's reading glass from the 19, close to the 1900s, uh, 1900. At the time, the close-up was more of a technical novelty, uh, and these early films are demonstrations of technology more than anything else. Through social exposure and continued use over time, techniques like the close-up became formal conventions and the pieces in, a larger, in the larger apparatus of cinema. Now, of course, using computer vision, we can enlist uh, computers to see these images on our behalf to find some of these patterns that emerge from conventional narrative techniques. For example, the shot reverse shot commonly used to depict conversations between characters in, in, in popular cinema. Using phase detection is possible to get a sense of how cinematic discourse is constructed through editing from wider shots that establish the relations between characters and their environments to you know, progressively zooming in sort of to, to close-ups uh, close of how these the faces of these characters to try to infer from their facial expression their inner states, their intentions, their emotions, and their reactions. Now, David Bordwell calls this uh, type of editing analytical editing that goes kind of from the general to the particular and is very common in, in contemporary popular cinema. Uh, now, again, the, the, with base, some basic modeling and some, some uh, basic intuitions, we can, by detecting faces, get a basic ratio that calculates the, the, the relation between the face and the bounding, the bounding box of the face and the frame size, and we can use this as a proxy for shot scale. And then we can have ourselves a little shot scale detector that can extend this computational exploration of film style to cover large collections of moving images, like film archives and online video platforms. At this point, we are zooming out and we are entering the realm of distant, distant viewing, distant reading, or distant uh, viewing of images, essentially. 
of course, this opens the door to all sorts of statistical manipulations and analysis, uh, uh, very much in the way that stylometry is applied to text to perform distant reading of literary collections uh, by essentially counting the number of words in a, in a corpus. You can count the number of shots, so the count, you can classify and count the different types of shots. So on the screen, you see a breakdown of one of these experiments that I, uh, I ran earlier for um, to, to do shot scale of a corpus of around 2,700 clips of 350 popular Hollywood films. Uh, and so you can, you, from these, you can, you can see how the distant viewing aspect of, of this type of work uh, can work. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit more and spend more time on the reverse of this, which would be zooming in. This is only one partial answer to this idea of why movies do not disconcert us and, and the, the reason why we, we interpret them the way we interpret them. Now, uh, how we make sense of these moving images for to, uh, the other part of the answer, I would argue, is that it comes into place, uh, it comes into place as we realize, as we realize that cinematic time is both actual and imagined. It's a recording as much as a synthesis of time. Cinematic time arises when fragmented recordings are rearranged to structure viewing such that the visible is presented on screen in ways that allow audiences to infer the invisible that is kept off screen. At its heart, this is the temporal epistemic trade-off struck by cinema. It reveals by withholding. It narrates by selectively keeping events from us. Cinema constructs a visible structure that allows us to imagine an invisible one. This invisible structure is much uh, is less explored, less understood, and certainly less present in how machine vision is currently thought about or designed. My argument here is that if we want to teach machines how to see, we need to train them not only on vast collections of actual visible images, but also on large collections of invisible ones. And before you, you, you lose patience with me and start thinking that I, I'm going into the esoteric here, uh, before I drift into, in, into this uh, type of thing, I have a more practical example of how I think uh, this can work um, out, this type of uh, hyper-localized uh, uh, machine vision. So not distant viewing, not even close reading, but kind of molecular reading, if you will, or to, to go into the very small, to the very tiny. Uh, so this is just one uh, quick diagram of, of, of the experiment that, I, that I've been running on this. So these are uh, representations of frames over time. And of course, you can calculate the difference in pixel values between each frame and between each pair of frames. So you get a measure of difference. So now I'm going to play you a clip. Uh, I hope I can. Yeah. So here it goes. It's a short clip. So this is a single shot. Uh, if we calculate the difference in pixel values between different frames, you get a signal that's a little bit like this. This is inspired to one extent to how uh, video compression works. Uh, so the, the video as, a, as understood as a sequence of frames, not every pixel value of every frame will be calculated at every step because it's computationally quite, it's, it's, it's ineffective in that sense. So there is a lot of video compression only the pixels where there is more change will be rendered again and again, frame after frame. Which means if you kind of reverse engineer video compression, you get a sense, uh, this kind of very uh, crude signal of change where you can locate where the change happens the most. So uh, this is the, the, the figure that you see here, where um, you get uh, the explosion, obviously, where there is a lot of change and you can visualize this change here and you have this other uh, other frame where very little happens in between uh, these couple of frames, and there is therefore uh, more or less black. Now this is there is nothing nothing technically sophisticated about this, but the the um, interesting uh, part for me is to is this notion of having differences. Uh, my contention here is that um, uh, oops, sorry that a film's capacity. Uh, to, to make it believable in some sense and to make it uh, the, the strong bonds that, that you get between these frames contribute to underpin the perceptual aspect of why we believe in the cinematic images and how we, the cin uh, cinematic time is uh, structured. So, um, there are min maximum and minimum differences uh, between these frames, but you can also have them uh, in terms of shots. So, 
the same time, what mid film's capacity to dilate and compress time at the level of shots and at the level of sequences. The interplay between these two properties makes films, films both structured and elastic, mechanistically bound, but also expressively designed. At this micro level, we can recognize at least two types of differences. A strong uh, differences, or to high frequency, small variations, versus lower frequency, higher variations. And it's the interplay, the dance between these very tiny, high frequency, slow variation, and slightly more regional, uh, uh, lower frequency, but higher variation, that uh, in my mind, uh, that I want to persuade you today, that contributes to this un perceptual underpinning of how cinematic time is constructed. So I have another clip uh, for you. This is a slightly longer, longer clip. His anger he has taken away his most precious gift to us. It's slightly longer and also has more shots. So this is a, a, a structure narrative that also travels in time, but also in space, in geography. So you can perform the same, the same, more or less the same type of calculation between the last frame of the previous shot and the next frame of the next shot to get a measure, a sense of how much change there is. And this is the second variation, the kind of the, the shot variation. And again, these are kind of uh, small scale experiments at, at this point. But you can imagine how, if you scale this up, you can uh, come up with some kind of integrated uh, time signature for, for this, no? So these differences over time are perceived, they're interpreted, and they're felt, even if they're not consciously processed. It is not really that we see uh, these images in our mind's eyes, uh, in our mind's eye, but rather that these images can be used as a proxy to visualize perceptual change, a type of computational phenomenology of moving images, if you want. And uh, this is uh, the reason I suspect this might work at a scale is also because these are, again, uh, just visualizations of the difference in pixel values. This is a false positive from the shot by shot uh, for the shot boundary detection, which means this is probably shouldn't, shouldn't have been uh, a cut in the first place, uh, whereas we can also recognize this as uh, intuitively as uh, with the shot in which there has been a lot more variation. Uh, in terms of uh, pixel values, at least, which is, again, like a, a very localized uh, difference. So from uh, montage theorists and, and film theorists from uh, Kuleshov to Podopkin to Eisenstein argue that cinematic time is kind of produced when filmmakers design an imagined relation between frames and between shots. And from this perspective, every shot presents the filmmaker with an opportunity to break and recouple time in, uh, and space in ways that create particular effects. These experiments that I uh, showed you uh, suggest these uh, rich local, regional, and global temporal differences that together give kind of a structural perceptual base to visual understanding and interpretation. Something maybe close, more closely related to Walter Benjamin's optical unconscious or more recently also Catherine Hale's cognitive unconscious. Uh, the quote that you see on the screen, the Tarkovsky quote, is more about rhythm, and the, his argument uh, is, is kind of against editing and more about rhythm. I, I, I believe this experiment kind of talked a little bit to what he was referring to in this, in this quote. Now, pixels, on the other hand, float freely. One cannot really say that any pixel is in a strong relationship with any other. They can be moved, rearranged, uh, regenerated uh, again and again to fit any design. Their, present, their representational powers are in this sense derived from the fact that they can be made to be contiguous in any direction, and such contiguity is always contingent. Pixels have no internal temporal form that we can understand or relate to. Their flow is unbound, so to speak. But just like frames uh, were once photographs, the, arrangement, the argument I present here today is that we simply haven't found yet the temporal forms that can endow the free flow of pixels with the strong relations necessary for aesthetic significance. 
So I invite you to reconsider first the assumption that human vision is uh, any good benchmark for machine vision at all, uh, taking an important lessons in this, in this sense from, from media studies to understand how human vision is already technically mediated in a sense, but also to show how these mediation structures are di very diverse ways of seeing at given historical points. It follows that in training computers to watch films, we are simultaneously training ourselves to watch a little bit more like machines. In seeking to model computationally what moves us about moving images, we are compelled to think and feel through a new kind of machinery. So where does this leave cinematic time? Well, from a generative perspective, motion is not really fragmented into a sequence of individual frames, but rather any one frame is already, already contains uh, the, the, uh, the potential for motion. Since the cinematic gives, in this way, uh, it gives way to the datamatic, in which time is not segmented and analyzed, but depicted and uh, predicted and synthesized. Now, from a kind of arts uh, perspective, the question extends well beyond the analysis of films using deep learning or computer vision methods. A computational spectatorship of film ought to include the new temporal structures that are emerging through the mass adoption of these technologies all the while prompting us to reimagine the future and maybe more interestingly still the past of media and the past of cinema under an algorithmic governance of the visual. So I want to end with this bit, um, which is obviously uh, the forthcoming book <laughs> that I want to say we've all been waiting for, especially me. Um, this epistemic uh, bargain at the heart of machine, this is, I think, the epistemic bargain at the heart of machine vision. In order to step back and look at film at a distance, one needs to first step close and look at it in the eye. In order to automate vision, one first has to engage in modeling. One needs to sculpt time with computers. But this is also, I think, the great promise. To make, data not, to, to make data not only of the images that were recorded, but also how they were recorded and what links these images together, what kinds of relations they govern their movement and their motion in between frames. Machine vision has a long way to go. We have not yet learned how to commit machines to a specific version of events. Data points flow freely and reorganize elastically, creating contingent patterns of proximity uh, in which, for which inferences are made and decisions are taken. These patterns might, might be there, but these relations, I suggest, are always point to an impermanence. They can easily be remade to suggest other proximities or other patterns. Other structures uh, can be all presented again and again, creating rational illusions in the process. Proximities like this are not binding in the way that events organized in a timeline are. Narrative events, as I have tried to argue today, are not only contiguous, but also continuous. Each event is affected by the previous one and weighs heavily on the ones that follow. Their ordering and rhythms matter a great deal, as Tarkovsky was uh, saying, and make each event bound to the others in powerful ways. This quality is useful to both epistemics and aesthetics. The types of relations created by continuity qualify beliefs committing contingent facts and events into strong relations that are then understood and can be, cannot be easily undone. These relations of necessity elicit in us the special kind of attention and memory that we reserve only for that, that which believe it can last. This is aesthetics. Aesthetics is slower, much slower than computer science in this sense or like computer vision, but it is necessary, I would argue, because uh, um, to make machine vision aesthetically sensitive, uh, is not as easy as it may as it may appear. Is not the date the types of data that we need to do this is not easily found. Uh, I have made a case today for uh, this space that it lies kind of within the computational phenomenology of film poetics, but there are other spaces like it, I believe. So in, to, to end uh, uh, my intervention, I would just say that this type of machine vision aesthetics is still need it still needs to be invented. So if you want to know more about this, please. Wait for the book. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is taking a lot of room. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniel. I think it's a, it's a very kind of beautiful and smart way of doing a kind of media philosophy or film philosophy through also computational methods while remaining critical of the kind of computation 
as a uh, kind of ultimate mode of knowledge production. So, and we are moving now from uh, kind of film to photography, or I should ever since Andrew Dudney told us to forget photography, maybe we should talk about after photography, which is what I do in my intervention, and Paolo's work around kind of post photography, after photography, images that hint at or remember and are in some kind of relationship or situationship with photography. So Paula Gortazar is a photography researcher and visual artist. She's a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster. Her research investigates developments in AI systems and expanded reality technologies. She's particularly interested in how these are exponentially changing the possibilities in which images, photographic images, can be created and used within and beyond virtual spaces. She's a founding member of the Expanded Photography Research Group at Westminster, and her work has been published in journals, and including Photography and Culture, Third Text, and also her visual art practice has been exhibited internationally, Canada, the US, and lots of other places. No. There we go. Over to you, Paula. Thank you. So, Hello. So, uh, meet Ronaldo. She's my digital alter ego in the metaverse, uh, Ronaldo Smith. So, if you see her around, say hello. I'll show you. Uh, it's a great place to be. Um, Horizon Worlds, if you haven't been in, um, I recommend it. So, um, as someone who was a child gamer before becoming an adult photographer, I have always found a striking resemblance between the act of photographing and the activity of playing video games. This similarity might explain why so many photography enthusiasts who enjoy gaming seem to have found in in-game photography the ultimate fulfilling experience. For some, this connection can be attributed to the perceptual experience of gamers when playing first-person shooting games. As Susan Sontang suggested in her book on photography, gun shooting and the act of photographing are clo closely connected, as both actions involve the hunting of a chosen subject. But the similarities between gaming and taking photographs seem to go way beyond this figurative hunting experience. As I would like to suggest today, what most gamers and photographers seem to share is, above all, a sense of adventure. A thrill that originates in the, visual, in the field of vision. This is generally followed by a range of psychological and biological reactions generated when attempting to fulfill their particular mission. Whether this entails, um, whether this entails completing the game objectives, taking the best possible picture, or as it happens in in-game photography practices, the simultaneous accomplishment of the two. Photography has been closely linked to humanity's adventure spirit since the moment of its invention from the groundbreaking scientific adventure that marked its invention to the use of the medium by explorers, travel and wildlife photographers during the last two centuries. The photographic camera has constantly accompanied photographers on their quest for new discoveries and life experiences. In this regard, the possibility of producing a visual document offers some sort of emotional encouragement. The motivation one might need when considering the risks of a photographic situation. It is the camera that often pushes the photographer to move forward, reassuring them that an exciting scene may lay just around the dark corner, on the summit of the highest mountain, or beyond the limits of the, sub of the subject's visual field. Adventure is then, of course, also at the core of most gaming experiences. The majority of video games offer players the opportunity to enter fantastical worlds where their fictional adventures are designed to keep them engaged during extended periods. When entering the game space for the first time, players first a completely unknown world they must learn to navigate. 
Each video game would then have its own rules and perceptual borders that simultaneously, simultaneously enable and limit the possibilities of gameplay behavior. This is not very different from what a photographer might experience in the material world, especially when they are set to document, uh, to, sorry, when they are set to take documentary or street photography style pictures. Whether the activity of taking those photographs happens in their own neighborhood, a nearby city, or a remote, a remote land away from home, the photographer's state of mind enters some sort of fictional existence. The world around them, reality, is no longer there to aid their everyday survival. It is now the scenery for their visual stories. Interestingly, when playing in non-immersive environments, gamers approach the game space through the two-dimensional frame of the screen, which might then open up into three or two-dimensional perspectives. The adventure is, therefore, framed before the eyes, separated from the physical world by a clear border that distances the player fictional present in the game from the physical existence in the material world. This is not dissimilar to what a photographer does when framing a chosen scene, as they separate the depicted subject from the rest of the world, isolating the action and limiting their presence to a confined two-dimensional space. It is also worth noting that the visual perception of first-person players within the game scene is practically identical to that of the photographer when looking through the camera's viewfinder. In her book, <laughs> uh, Perception at the End of the World, or How to Not to Play Video Games, Joanna Silinska explains how the gamer's, um, the gamer's perception does not only occur at a level of sight, but as an ecological model that involves the immersive presence of the, of the perceiving agent's body. This embodied experience of a separate reality may also be achieved through the act of taking pictures, particularly in the case of reflex cameras, where the viewfinder shows a mirror image of that which the film or sensor might eventually capture. In such cases, the combination of camera view and the bodily presence of the photographer allows them to perceive a reality they are no part of, entering a scene that remains alien to their presence, yet unconsciously simulating a psychological involvement in the depicted event. We might then agree with Cindy Poremba's assertion that photography is inherently a game-like practice. Indeed, the photographer seems to enter the material world in a very similar way to that of a player entering a video game both at a level of visual perception and psychological anticipation. It is precisely this psychological anticipation, the quest for the unexpected, that seems to have driven millions to experiment with generative image systems. There is certainly something fascinating about the experience users have when interacting with such platforms. In the lack of a pictureable scene, one must first imagine the possibility of a photograph, use language to name its elements and relate them grammatically to one another in the hope the algorithm will eventually match their visual fantasy. For some, a true matching is really all they're after. Others hope secretly for an improved version of their imagined realities. For most, however, it is the unexpected that brings on the excitement. But where is this unexpected exactly coming from? And why do we seem to search for it so badly? There is of course a well-known scientific reasoning for this that actually explains the origin and formation of generative visual products. This explanation, as we all know, lies in the millions of image text pairs within a given data set. When activated by a generative algorithm, these pairs transform a single noise vector into an entirely new composite image. But despite understanding the science behind it, its possibilities and limitation, every time I look at a newly generated photograph, I often find myself wondering whether I could possibly be gazing at the picture of humanity's collective imagination, a visual merging of every conceivable interpretation attributed to the prompted subject. This captivating visual creation, however, owns its existence equally to machines and their automated vision, 
transforming each generated image into a visual cyborg, one does, that is intellectually human yet robo uh, produced through robo oh, sorry, robotic means. As the creators of generative systems probably anticipated, the algorithmic magic offered by this image-making process soon captivated millions of users across the world. For photographers, however, this fascination was understandably even more profound. But beyond their natural affinity for images, the fascination probably arose from the psychological anticipation and visual expectations generated during the prompting process. After all, these sensations closely parallel the experiences photographers may undergo in the darkroom as they eagerly await for the revelation of a latent image or the appearance of a recent shot in the on the digital screen. Interestingly, the user interface present in generative image platforms is reminiscent of some early text-based video games from the 60s and the 70s, such as Colossal Cave Adventure, which was launched in 1976. In the game, um, the player explores a cave system set to be filled with treasure. The game is composed of dozens of locations and the player moves between these spaces, interacting with objects by typing one or two word commands, which are then interpreted by the game's natural language input system. The program acts as a narrator, describing the results of the player's attempted actions. This was the first example of interactive fiction as well as the first known adventure game. In case of the generative imaging platforms, rather than narrating our results, the interactive dialogue replies to a verbal command with visual language. And just like the gamer playing Colossal Cave Adventure, we tend to reply back repeatedly as we aim to get closer to our imagined visual treasure. Returning now to my early discussion around the connections between gaming and photography and concretely the adventure spirit often enjoyed by the protagonists of both types of activities, there is no question that the act of photographic, photographing carries significantly less risks than gaming and thus, we might argue, a greater sense of adventure. While the photographer confronts the adventure of taking pictures in the real world from a relatively free but unpredictable position, players always enter the game space that has been carefully designed for them to succeed, albeit with time and effort, but with multiple cues that guide the game playing behavior and warranty the possibility of victory. As a result, it might be argued that in-game photography practices are often too guided and constrained to be defined as adventures of any kind. Nonetheless, such practices have become hugely popular during the last decade, with thousands of adults around the world taking pictures inside their favorite video games. In most cases, these are taken either for promotional purposes or a visual record of the player's achievements. Most interesting, however, are the cases where the user enters the game space with no intention of completing any of its objectives. Instead, they wander around the gaming worlds, turning the game environment into a space of photographic voyeurism, but also in a place for artistic critique on the virtual representation of contemporary issues. One of the first artists to critique the erratic visual facade of the game space was Robert Overwork. Since the year 2010, the artist became fascinated with the exploration of 3D spaces, where players were able to wander around virtual scene through first or third person perspectives. While scanner view often shows gamers an infinite space, the game scene has a confined area where gameplay ought to unfold. Instead of following the natural gaming behavior, Overworld walks his avatars towards the virtual limits of these worlds, visualizing all sorts of glitches across the designated boundaries of the game space. The resulting work puts on the points at the existence of an externally controlled gameplay experience whilst it celebrates the triumph of free will and the possibilities of owing one's particular virtual path. Mainstream video games, such as Grand Theft Auto, the Grand Theft Auto Saga, GTA, 
have also been the object of analysis of various photographers during the last decade. In her photo book, Paisaje Ulterior, from 2018, Gabriela Mesones Rojo collects scenes from the game's environment. Her subjects belong to Los Santos, a fictional city where gangs have taken control. Populated by the homeless, prostitutes and drug dealers, the game space replicates some of the worst stereotypes of 21st century society. Black people and those of colour are often depicted as criminals. Transgender characters are all sex workers and the homeless are often drunk or desperately searching through garbage. In this scenario, Mesones Rojo wanders around the video game in search of visual traces of the city of extremes. Most of her images depict evidence of the urban tragedy, as they speak quietly about the inability of regular citizens to intervene, or resolve in any manner the chaotic state of things. Through the critical practice, both artists propose alternative models of in-game experience, building their own navigation rules, documenting and denouncing discriminative virtual behaviours or reconfiguring their virtual media practice through its displacement into the physical materiality of a photo book. Most interesting about the work, however, is the presence of a fictional photographic space, a virtual environment designed by others, which these photographers embrace as a place of being rather than playing. But unfortunately for both, and despite its fantastical outlook, the space is full of limitations, both with regards to its navigability and the confined possibilities of its narrative fiction. But this constrained virtual experience might well have its days numbered. Thanks to the application of generative AI to game design, developers are already applying generative tools for the creation of automated characters, able to develop richer dialogues with players. In the meantime, some are already envisioning the possibilities of adaptative open-world video games that create unique storylines in response to the gameplay behaviour of each user. In the context of the video game industry, the benefits of tailored game experiences are quite clear. That is, to engage players in a never-ending mission while giving the impression of continuous victory. But what would happen if it were the users themselves who were able to generate their own scenes, their own game spaces and write the particular navigation rules. For those who enter the video game environment as a photographic space, generative AI would offer the unprecedented possibility of building their very own virtual scenarios. A three-dimensional generative scene where the two-dimensional photographs might be designed at will a place where photographic subjects would hold whatever visual characteristics they might wish, where lightning can be used at scale and tripods may no longer be needed, a replica world where the avatars of friends and family might be invited to come and pose in the most spectacular photographic studio. These generative scenes might even be blended with those of fellow photographers and automatically shift in shape and form as they adapt to their creative needs. Inbuilt virtual cameras would also be packed with generative tools, providing users with full technical control whilst offering, whilst offering um, life alternatives to improve their generated results. Under such prospect, generative photographic spaces may soon become the most exciting shooting location for professional and amateur photographers alike one that will also reduce equipment and travel costs whilst moving the photographic medium closer to our susten sustainability goals. So for those who thought that current generative image systems were the ultimate photographic frontier, there is clearly so much more to be achieved. Thanks to the growing relationship between humans and our fascinating viewing machines, our next photographic adventure is only about to begin. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Paula. And it was very exciting for me to hear in all three presentations how you've all shown how uh, humans are being entrained by machines to change the way we see the world. So there is that kind of loopy system of perception, of vision. And it's something I'm going to talk to you. So we've got two more things for you. So I'm, I'm going to talk. I'm not going to give a full 20-minute talk, so worry not. I'll talk for a bit shorter. And... Uh, present some ideas from the book. Here's the book. Um, and then we'll have a kind of quick Q&A and hopefully we'll have a reception. Uh, I mean, we were meant to have a reception, so uh, I shouldn't sound so speculative and hypothetical about this, but, you know. Anyway, so um, in my work, I combine media philosophy and image-based art practice. And my short talk offers a critical reflection on machine vision developed here alongside an art project, which is a video work called Neuromatic, which deals with the problem of machine and computer vision. And to make that video, which is slightly over six minutes long and it's got a voiceover, I re reanimate it with the help of a big GAN algorithm, some historical and contemporary images of eyes and brains. And the images were taken from the Welcome Collection, which is a UK repository of medical images. The idea behind this work was to raise some questions about perception unfolding between the eye, the brain and the world in humans and machines. So here are the source images that were then remediated. The video title, Neuromatic, is a coinage of two terms, neuro referring to the nerves or the nervous system, and matic standing for something referring to the eye, mati in Greek, also referring to matic as an automatic willing to perform. So neuromatic captures this link between the eye and the brain in the visual apparatus, but it also offers a provocation on whether vision itself can be understood in machinic terms. Now, the problem of machine vision has been of interest to me for a long time. A few years ago, I published a short book titled AI Art, Machine Visions and Walk Dreams. The book presented a polemic about different ways of viewing art at a time of the rise of machine creativity driven by so-called AI. And I said there's some rather critical things about GANs, generative uh, adversarial networks and their aesthetics. But I'm not, I've relied on GANs to make neuromatics. I'm not claiming that GANs or indeed any other AI-driven algorithms, techniques, models are mindless or evil per se. Although, you know, the jury is still out on that. But for me, a lot of uh, AI art becomes much more interesting when it performs its paragonal function, which is to say, when it functions together with the commentaries, with the discourse, with an engagement, where there is something happening between the artifact, the technology, and the discussion, the debate around it. And maybe, so this is where the kind of work pushes us to ask questions about the nature and structure of the world. And the question I wanted to raise in my, my video in a more open-ended way that I do in my writing, which is more academic, were as follows. Can machines see? What does it mean for us humans to endow machines with the capacity for seeing? They're the questions that frame today's event, uh, they frame the book, but they also frame the talks of, of our speakers. What does it mean to classify as seeing machines' ability to differentiate between objects in the world on the basis of the light reflected of those objects and transmitted to those machines' processors? But do we actually fully understand how we humans see the world? And is there even a, a we that does the seeing? Are we, in fact, seeing machines? So you can say the video is an invitation to deal with questions that computer science often deals with, but in a way that perhaps goes beyond many established uh, paradigms in computer vision. Now, maybe some terminological qualification is in order. We need to distinguish between computer vision and machine vision. So machine vision is a systems engineering discipline that works on the automatic extraction of information from digital images to enable machines to perform tasks requiring human sight. Such tasks may include quality control, identification and verification, and can be applied in self-driving cars, security or space exploration. Machine vision systems rely on cameras with sensors, on processing hardware, and on software algorithms. So machine vision contains computer vision, although in everyday parlance and in some science papers, the two terms are sometimes used interchangeably. 
At present, the goal of machine vision is to imitate the way humans see the world, but also to learn how to see better, that is faster and more efficiently than humans. But in my work, I'm interested in exploring what it actually means to say that machines are capable of seeing. However, I prefer to speak of machine perception than machine vision. But it's not just me, though. In recent years, many machine vision researchers have gone beyond the explicit focus on the eye to include other senses, such as hearing, touch, and olfaction. Expanding their data sources from images to sounds, music, and video, Google is now using the term machine perception in lieu of machine vision. But for me, what machine perception really needs is a shift of focus from the flatness of 2D images to the 3D environment which produces them. This more active and dynamic understanding of vision in terms of perception and movement departs from the definition of vision as proposed in the foundational text of computer vision by David Marr, published in 1982, in which vision was understood primarily as a problem of information processing. Marr assumed that the mechanism of primary visual processes, such as edge detection or binocular vision, binocular vision was computational, and that it worked its way from those primary processes upwards all the way to the brain. Now, the notion of machine perception I'm using aims to address one of the key blind spots of computer vision today, its inability to account for how our brains actually work and have the translation process from retinal stimulation through to the neural circuits of the brain occurs while producing a sensation and an awareness of its sensation recognized in the form of an image that we see. Basically, no one quite knows how we see, and I'm kind of wary because, you know, it's a science university. We've got lots of scientists working on vision. I'm not saying that scientists don't know anything. We know a lot about the mechanics of seeing and about some individual neural processes, but how it's all put together and how it's experienced by us as seeing is still a mystery. Uh, so uh, good luck with teaching machines how to see. And it's, you know, it's basically another name for the hard problem of consciousness that we're kind of talking about, how that experience is experienced. And machines interpret images very simply as a series of pixels, each within their own set of color values. Like my notion of machine perception therefore aims to complicate the simplicity of this model and to explore a different way of what it might mean for machines to see or not see, as the case may be. But I also want to challenge this idea of the brain as the core organ of perception in humans. Bearing this criticism in mind, I want to turn to the following question. Is it possible to construct a perception machine? Now, this question was originally posed by biologist and Nobel laureate Gerald M. Edelman and his collaborator George Enrique Jr. in their 1990 paper. Edelman and Riggs' work was part of the wider project on the neglect of findings from evolutionary biology in AI research. The two researchers scold AI scientists for remaining too bogged down in assumptions drawn on the one hand from the arguments of Alan Turing and Alonzo Church about the universal problem-solving capabilities of computers, suggesting that the brain may be understood as a computer, and on the other hand from the reductionism of molecular biology, suggesting that the brain may be understood as a collection of units that exchange chemical signals. So it's interesting for me to go and read some kind of biology papers as well for, from scientists who are, you know, top of their game according to, you know, um, their peers, but also who are engaging seriously with computer science research, but also saying, well, if we looked at this, you know, the same sets of concepts from a slightly different disciplinary perspective, maybe we would have different theories. Maybe we could ask some questions of the currently uh, adopted model of machine vision and the misnomer that are neural networks, because there is nothing neural about those networks, as many of you, including neuroscientists, will know. The strictly computational approach um, uh, Edelman and Enrique uh, argued can't really tell us much about perception because of its foundational error, namely the belief that objects and categories exist out there in the world so humans or machines can just go and find these things. But the world is much messier and more complex than this. Recursive neural networks used in deep learning, which consist of layers of nodes, have partly addressed the problem of complexity. They've had significant successes in identifying patterns in imprecise data, for example, in applications such as face recognition, medical data analysis, or natural language translation. 
Yet neural ne networks as currently conceived in AI research still don't ultimately challenge the assumption that information exists in the, uh, in the world, while the organism is a receiver rather than a creator of criteria leading to information. I'm particularly interested with this in Edelman and Rick's critique of the idea of objects and events existing in the world out there to be seen, grasped, and manipulated by us. As a response to what they see as computational schematism, they suggest that any viable theory of categorization and intelligence to be used in AI research needs to embrace the Darwinian model of selection, but adjusted for the working of neurons of a single organism operating during its lifetime. The conclusion serves as the grounding for the 1990 paper about the possibility of constructing a perception machine. Yet Edelman and Rick's concept of the perception machine itself remains hamstrung by the aculturalism of their model, with machinic operations positioned as primarily driven by natural selection. They dismiss the cultural transmission of information as irrelevant to the evolutionary development of perceptual systems. However, deciding which aspects of the surrounding can be classified as nature and which belong to culture is not straightforward. The construction of culture as a separate domain of uninheritable features will allow computer scientists to ignore embodied and embedded modes of perception and cognition. The disembodied model of computer vision results in the preservation of one of the biggest science and computer science myths. The belief that data, that is, uh, that data bias understood as cultural bias, once eliminated, will result in the data that is both pure and fair. Two recent examples include the video conferencing platform Zoom's background algorithm, which removed the head of a black academic any time he tried to use a virtual background, and the Twitter cropping algorithm, which always privileged the showing of white faces and cropped images in the timeline. So while the computer vision machine reveals itself to be not particularly perceptive, the consequences of the racialized blind spots are anything but trivial. Indeed, the algorithms that run within it are the same ones that make decisions about people's social, financial, and legal status, including punitive action and border control, denial of credit, or as the assignation of criminality. One factor is that the image databases that serve as training sets for the algorithms are not properly representative, being skewed in terms of volume and quality, as we saw in, in the previous talks, towards photogra photographs of white males. But there is a deeper logic at work here, with a whole systemic infrastructure involved in the production of cameras, lighting systems, image processing software, and the visual and cultural training of photographers and image technicians, producing internalized norms that then are passed off as pure and hence objective engineering. This mode of thinking embedded in all sorts of technologies that precede the digital is what Sophia Noble has described in her books, uh, her book Algorithms of Oppression, as a technological redlining. Noble leaves us no illusion that algorithmic oppression is fundamental to the operating systems of the web. So it's a feature, not a bug. It's therefore not enough to just debias the data. Rather, we need to ask bigger questions about the forms of injustice embedded in the systems that host it. We also have to ask what it means when the elimination of the glitch, while desirable from a technical point of view, ends up making the punitive surveillance running on this data even more efficient. The correction of the data bias doesn't correct the violently penetrative and extractivist logic of the computer vision system. It actually strengthens it. So can we do better than that? So that brings me to the book, um, the, photo, the, the Perception <coughs> Machine, which um, we're kind of launching today as part of this event. So the book is available open access. So a big shout out to the MIT Press and to its direct to open program, which is financed mainly by the library network from the US and other places. And that's why I think they've been able over the last two years to publish many books in arts and humanities on an open access basis without uh, myself and others paying author processing charges. So uh, the book is available as a paperback as well, so it can be purchased, but there is a free PDF to be downloaded.
Now here's a little optical task for you. It's a piece I did for Cura magazine recently. Uh, the notion of the machine, about this perception machine, which is still apt for our increasingly algorithmic society, borrows from Deleuze and Guattari's expansion of this term beyond its technical capabilities to encapsulate its social dimension. The perception machine for me is an assemblage of the technical, the corporeal and the social. It is therefore more like a system than a single object. There are multiple levels of meaning to what this concept stands for in the book. To begin with, it has biological connotations, signifying the system of perception in human and non-human animals. The perception machine is also a technical machine, understood as an apparatus uh, or indeed a camera. Perception here is equivalent to image making, a process of the temporary stabilization of the optical flow that involves apparatuses such as cameras, telescopes and scanners, but also the wider technical infrastructure supporting those devices. The perception machine also names a machinic ensemble of perceiving and image making agents. Further on, the term has connotations of the Foucauldian dispositif and Flusserian appar apparatus, whereby it stands for the bigger socio-political setup. Or as photography tutors at Bard College, Ariel Goldberg and Yazan Khalili put it even more explicitly, referring to the violent use of images in attempts to consolidate national power, the state is the ultimate camera, the camera that eats all other cameras. The concept of the perception machine therefore highlights the interlocking of scientific and cultural discourses in the production of images and in the production of subjectivity and objectivity as functions of those images. Now, from the outline presented, it may seem that my key conversational partners in the discussion about uh, photography and imaging are Western male philosophers and media theorists. And this is indeed where the conversation starts. But I come to this tradition as an unruly daughter, a gonorrhoeal or Reagan without the malice, or a Cordelia without the death wish with an aim of rewriting and reweaving the texture of the established discourse on technology with my own silicon thread. So in the process, I hope to make the still rather masculine field of media philosophy a little bit more my own. Starting from the book's title, which is a virilio flusser hybrid with a twist, I aim to cut across positions, postulates and postures to open a different mode of thinking about media objects and practices. And this mode of thinking also evolves a, a making. So there are some visual projects in the book. Uh, there is a, they are available on a separate website. There is a QR code in a book or a link. So you can kind of, the book comes out of itself and goes to other things. Or you might just go to these other things immediately. And then with this, I'm kind of trying to enact a media philosophy, less in the genre of me theory, and more as a process of interweaving, interconnectedness, and intellectual as well as bodily kinship made up with words, images, and corpora of various kinds. So uh, I hope you'll kind of go and download the, the perception machine. 